Um, last week, we got introduced to um, chemical bonding, the ionic model. Actually, we learned how to name compounds last week. And that, that included some covalent compounds, but we're going to look at covalent. We're going to look at covalents uh, today in earnest. Can you find the plane to sit? What? Okay. <clears throat> Maybe I'll leave uh, uh, what's his name? Who's got physics in here? Nobody? It must be my other class. Sure, Vincent. I gotta leave Vincent a message. Maybe I'll just write a big message across the board. Then we'll get rid of his microscopes. As <clears throat> so we need the seating space. All right. Chapter five, that's just an outline. There are a lot of topics, but they're not long topics. When we consider the, the ionic versus the covalent bond, we're looking at a, a difference between a complete transfer of electrons between atoms versus a sharing of electrons. And I think I mentioned it last time we when we look at the the bond between two atoms, um, they always have some covalent character, some ionic character. Some they, they're never 100 percent ionic or 100 percent covalent. We do have some except. OK, I'll give you one exception. When both of the atoms are exactly the same element, then you can claim 100 percent sharing. Like um, uh, two hydrogens, right? If they're both the same element, then they have the same attraction for electrons on either end, and there's there's only one option is sharing. But if you get, um, let's see, if you try to bond nitrogen and oxygen. Yeah, that's good. If you try to bond nitrogen and oxygen, then one of them has a stronger pull on electrons, which would be the oxygen. And it tends to to give some ionic character to the bond, but it's still a covalent, it's considered a covalent bond. It's sharing. All right. That's all I'll say about that right now. Because there's more to come. Ionic bonds tend to form between metals and nonmetals, and the further apart they are, left to right, on the periodic table, the more ionic the character. So the most ionic bond would be, say, uh, rubidium and fluorine. That's about as far apart as you can get. <clears throat> they would be the most ionic bonds possible, whereas covalent bonds form between two nonmetals such as, well, two hydrogens, a nitrogen and oxygen, uh, sulfur and oxygen, carbon and uh, hydrogen. Two nonmetals. Um, we mentioned the second point already, the transfer of electrons for ionics, the sharing of electrons for covalents is a general rule. Um, ionic compounds don't contain discrete molecules. In other words, units, collections of atoms bonded together that behave as a single unit when they encounter well, other collections of their own or difference. Whereas ionic compound, well, these are ionic compounds. The ionic compounds are composed of a network of positive and negatively charged atoms. And I think the last time I used an example was sodium and chlorine table salt. When sodium and chloride get together, they're just 
a network of negatives and positives. And then you stick some sodiums in here. And so you just get this network that goes on and on in a cubic lattice. Right? I mentioned that last time, didn't I? Spill salt and look at it with a yeah, magnifying glass. You're going to see little cubes. <clears throat> and that's an, a clue to the uh, atomic structure, or the ionic structure of that compound. So the way we represent these uh, ionic compounds is the simplest whole number ratio. And the best way to do that is just balance the charges. Um, whereas the basic structural unit of a covalent compound is the molecule. The shared electrons form a bond between atoms in the molecule, and that forms a discrete unit that acts independently. So the formula for a covalent compound is a representation of the, um, the number and types of atoms in that group, such as water. Okay. That's a discrete molecule, and when it encounters some other water molecules, it interacts with them, but it, it doesn't. Uh, the bonds, internal bonds of the molecule are intact always. Those are the basic differences between ionic and covalent bonding. Um, we can we can get some macroscopic uh, indications, uh, actually uh, properties, macroscopic properties of these types of compounds or elements. And for ionic compounds, um, all of them are solids at room temperature. I don't know of any ionic compound that's a liquid or a gas at room temperature. Now, you can make them liquids, you can make them gases. All you have to do is add enough energy, like heat them up. In fact, sodium chloride uh, is used in some engineering applications as a heat transfer medium. And they heat it up hot enough to liquefy sodium chloride, and then it's very efficient transfer, transfers heat from one place to another. <clears throat> but that's an extreme. Whereas covalent compounds can exist in any of the three phases we've studied, solids, liquids, or gases. Now, for those of you who've uh, done the extra credit with the periodic table, you know which two elements are liquids at room temperature. Bromine's one of them, right? The other one's mercury. And now we're talking about compounds. So uh, compounds, for instance, at room temperature, water is a liquid. At room temperature, carbon dioxide, though, is a gas. Uh, at room temperature, let's see, which would be a good example of a solid? Silicon dioxide is a solid at room temperature. Right? Been to the beach lately? Okay. You got silicon di dioxide all over your feet, all over your hands, all over your towels. It's sand. It's a solid. Um, <clears throat> ionic compounds will not, the solid, the solid ionic compounds will not transfer, with, are not good conductors of electricity. They don't conduct electricity. They don't conduct heat either. <clears throat> so if I took a big, if I had a big, nice big cubic crystal of sodium chloride and put two electrodes on either side and hooked it to a battery and a light, the light would be dead. No light. But if you take sodium chloride and put it in water, dissolve it in water, now those ions are free to move and they can transfer the, the current across those electrodes. <clears throat> so ionic compounds, when they're in solutions, will conduct electricity. Whereas when they're in solid form, they will not because those ions are locked in place. Um, whereas covalent compounds, uh, many of them are uh, solids at room, well, yeah, solids at room temperature. 
But when you dissolve them in water, some of them can be dissolved in water, some of them can't. But when you dissolve them in water, they don't conduct electricity because they're they're not they don't have an ionic nature. They can't transfer charge. So we can put you can put tons and tons and tons of table sugar in water, you know, and make a hummingbird feed uh, liquid, right? <clears throat> but it will it still won't conduct electricity. In fact, you can put so much table sugar in water that you've got more sugar than water in it. Typically, when you make herm hummingbird feeder, you you do a 50-50 mix. All right. So the covalent bond, by definition, is a sharing of electrons between two elements. They can be the same element. They can be the, the same element or they can be different elements. So they can be uh, di, tri, um, tetra, let's see, octa uh, elements. Like um, phosphorus is P4 typically and sulfur is S8. And when they form those um, multi-atomic elements, those are covalent bonds. Uh, and then there's the diatomics, right? You have memorized those already, right? Hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. <clears throat> those are all covalent bonds. <clears throat> and this is an artist's representation of two hydrogen atoms sharing electrons. They've only got one electron piece. So they can only form one bond. Remember, I'll tell you... Uh, That line represents a bond, and it also equals two electrons. So whenever you see a line between two atoms, it represents two electrons. If you see two lines between them, it's four electrons. Three lines between them, six electrons. So every bond has to have two electrons. And hydrogen only has an electron each, so they can only form a single bond. Um, so why do these bonds form? Right? It's not just um, I'm a lonely atom and I want a neighbor. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> the reason any bond forms is because the energy level after the bond for all the atoms included in the in the reaction, the energy level after is lower than the energy level before. That signals stability. Everything's, everything in the universe is trying to become more stable. So when the bond forms, this uh, H2 molecule is more stable, has a lower energy than the individual hydrogen atoms separated. And we can quantify that value. All we have to do is measure how much energy do we have to put into H2 to bust it into H, to bust it into two H's. Right, if we go from here as a gas and we put energy into it and we end up with two hydrogen atoms like that, the amount of energy that we put in, uh, we sometimes we represent heat as a, a delta sign. So we know how much energy it takes to break the bond. So we can tell how much more stable this is than that because we had to add energy to get them apart. So the lower energy uh, implies stability. Um, we did Lewis dot structures already, didn't we? Yeah, I, I know we did in, in last week. Uh, where you try to, for the hydrogens, of course, it's, it's duets, but for the second and third and some of the fourth period, you're trying for an octet. Right? So, for instance, uh, nitrogen's going to be uh, nitrogen is going to be one, two, three, four, five. So that's it's a, that's its Lewis notation, Lewis dot structure for nitrogen. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay. A covalent bond occurs when they're sharing of valence electrons. And that's, that's a good reminder for these reactions occur when either transfer of valence electrons or sharing of valence electrons. Right. Remember what a valence electron is. By definition, it's any of the electrons that are available for bonding. <clears throat> the only ones that are available for bonding are at the highest energy levels, <clears throat> at the highest principal quantum number. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so in the second period, we move over to nitrogen and we find that Roman numeral five says there are five electrons in its valence shell. And if we write the structure for nitrogen, right, uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah, 7 electrons. These are the valence electrons because they have the highest principal quantum number. That's how you tell. <clears throat> those are valence electrons, and those are the only ones that are involved in bonding on the valence. The rest of them, everything below that, those are called core electrons. <clears throat> and we know they're different, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> because <clears throat> we can ionize these atoms by adding energy. Add a certain amount of energy, and you'll kick off an electron and make a positive ion. You add a little bit more energy, you can kick off a, a second electron and make a two plus ion for nitrogen. You can make a you can make a five plus ion for nitrogen by adding successively more and more energy. But when you get down to the core and you try to kick off these electrons, it takes an order of magnitude more energy. Everybody know what an order of magnitude is? Powers of 10. So one order of magnitude would be an increase 10 times. Two orders of magnitude would be 100 times. <clears throat> so we know that these, uh, we're justified in calling them core electrons because it's very difficult to remove them. Lots of energy required. Okay. Now, when we draw Lewis dot structures of um, molecules and ionic compounds, a convenient way is to, uh, well, our example here is, say, HF. Hydrogen has one valence electron. How many does fluorine have? <clears throat> Where is it on the periodic table? Count from the left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven over seven valence electrons. Three, four, five, six, seven. So all it needs to appear to be the electronic structure of neon. Right? And that's, they're all trending toward noble gas configurations, that's where they're the most stable. All it has to do is share that electron with hydrogen. And now, count around it, eight electrons for fluorine. We didn't add an electron, it just thinks it has an extra one by the bonding process. Hydrogen thinks it has two, which makes it look like what? Helium, right? So it looks like helium. <clears throat> and then we represent those the bonded electrons as a line. And if we want to complete the Lewis dot structure, we just fill in the rest of the electrons. Okay. That's why it looks like that. <clears throat> All right. So there's also the, um, Let's see, the point atom, here we go. These that are between atoms, these electrons are called bonding electrons. And these that are not part of the bonding are non-bonding electrons. That's very original terminology. So when we refer to bonding electrons, they have to be between two atoms. And they don't have to be just single bonds. Right? If we bonded two nitrogens, Right. How many valence does it have? Five. Right. One, two, three, four, five. Like that. One, two, 
three, four, five. So in order to for nitrogen to look like neon, it needs three. It needs to share three electrons. So it shares these two, these two, these two. And now the each nitrogen thinks it looks like neon, electronically speaking. And we represent those like this. Okay, that would be the Lewis Dock structure of dinitrogen. <clears throat> um, that's why nitrogen gas is virtually inert. Because when you have three bonds between the two atoms, they're very strongly bound together. It takes a lot of energy to get them apart. So this nitrogen that we breathe in the air is virtually inert to us. And it's, and it's actually useless to most plants. Because plants need fixed nitrogen. They need something like ammonia or nitrates. Right? If you look at your uh, polyatomic ion chart, you'll see nitrogen in the form of what? Ammonium. Right? Like that. Or you might see it like this. Nitrate. That's called fixed nitrogen. That's available to plants. They can use that because these very strong bonds have been broken. And now they can get at the nitrogen. But most plants can't do it on their own. They need microorganism help. So if you, if you want to see the evidence of microorganisms at work doing this process, breaking this nitrogen bond, just uh, dig up a clover. If you got any white clover in your yard, just take a shovel and dig it up and knock the dirt off of it. It's got little nodules on the roots. There's, there's symbiotic organisms in those nodules, microorganisms, that uh, gather energy from, they get energy and nutrients from the plant, and what they give back in return is they take nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it like that so that the plant can use it. That's a true symbiosis. Those are called legumes. Lots of different plants are legumes. Clover's one of them. Alfalfa's another, right, as far as uh, farm crops go. But there are other legumes out there that they have the capacity to fix nitrogen, but they don't always do it. Now, the way to tell if that nodule is working is you just take a knife and cut the nodule, and if it's pink inside, it's working. Okay, <clears throat> so that's enough digression for now. Let's move on. <clears throat> oh, uh, un the unbonded electrons, bonding and un non bonding, they're also called lone pairs. I missed that point. Lone electron pairs are not bonding. There's a single covalent bond, represents two electrons for that one bond. There are double bonds, carbon dioxide. Right. As uh, carbon is four steps over, it has four valence electrons, so it needs four more electrons to look like neon. And it gets two from one oxygen and two from the other oxygen. That's why it forms those two double bonds. And then oxygen, of course, looks like neon also because it gets two electrons to one oxygen, two electrons to the other oxygen. And oxygen is in the sixth position. It only needs two electrons to look like neon. So everybody's happy. And carbon dioxide is at a lower energy than the uh, oxygen or the carbon from which it's made. And there's your nitrogen with its triple bond. So how many electrons does that represent? Three electron pairs, six electrons. In a double covalent bond, two pairs, it's four, correct? Four electrons. Okay. Um, what you'll learn over time is that some of these elements particularly the, uh, the nonmetals, have a tendency to form a certain number of bonds. 
And that is related to their tendency to want to look like a noble gas. So carbon wants to look like neon. Right? It needs four electrons, which means it needs four bonds somehow. It can have four single bonds. It can have a double bond and uh, two other single bonds. Or it could have two double bonds like carbon dioxide. Um, let's see. Could it have a, a triple and a single? Yeah, it can have a triple and a single. Um, but they have a tendency to form this certain number of bonds. Nitrogen tends to form three bonds. Like, um, let's see, good, an example of carbon and its four bonds is methane. Be like that. Nitrogen only wants to form three. So what do you get there with a lone pair? You get ammonia. Nitrogen likes to form three bonds. Oxygen likes to only form two bonds. Okay. So it would be like, uh, well, with its neighbor, right? it could do that. Or with a carbon dioxide, it could form two bonds with carbon. And then another oxygen forms two bonds. So that keeps carbon happy and it keeps oxygen happy. <clears throat> and it's all trend, trending toward that octet. All right, so there's a, oxygen can form the two single bonds. Uh, they can form uh, water with two hydrogen atoms. It can form two single bonds. Or it can form a double bond with its neighbor oxygen or with carbon like I mentioned earlier. Nitrogen likes to form three. So if it's nitrogen with nitrogen, three bonds between those two atoms. Or if it's uh, ammonia, yeah, ammonia, uh, it forms it with hydrogen. Or it could form two bonds and a single bond. Like you have hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other. So it'd be uh, NOH. Or HNO would probably be proper. And there's carbon. It likes to form four bonds. And uh, this is where organic chemists get off. They learn that about carbon and then they just, they forget everything else about general chemistry and just go off on their own. <laughs> How many covalent bonds can oxygen form? Two. Okay. Two bonds means four electrons. Uh, and it donates two electrons and it gets two electrons from its neighbor. Here's a strange kind of covalent bond. Oh, the, the coordinate. The coordinate covalent bond. It's still a covalent bond. And once the bond forms, you can't tell where the electrons came from. We can only deduce where the electrons came from. And with a coordinate covalent bond, the electrons that are contributed to the bond come from only one atom. So it's like another atom sneaks in and forms a bond. It doesn't have to give up anything. It just gets those two electrons, at least two electrons from the other atom. That's a coordinate covalent bond. And once the bond forms, you can't tell where the electrons come from. Like I said, you have to deduce it from what they were before the bond formed. What it does, though, is it allows uh, any atom that has two vacancies in its valence shell to share a pair of non-bonding electrons from another atom. Okay. Here's an example. See it H. CLO, H, C, L, O. Hydrogen hypochlorite, unless it's in water and then it's hypochlorous acid. But this one is perfectly happy the way it is, right? The example there gives you octets around oxygen, octets around chlorine, and a duet for hydrogen. So they're perfectly happy. But chlorine has non-bonding pairs. It has lone pairs. So this oxygen comes in 
and forms another bond. It, it gets the pair that it needs from the chlorine. Okay. So if oxygen, let's see, let's draw it like this. If, uh, let's draw it the way they did it. There's the oxygen, there's the chlorine, and we've got a bond here, we've got a bond there, and we've got like that. So oxygen's happy there, 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 and there. Then we've got an oxygen over here with only six electrons, and it needs two more. So it forms a bond right there. Yeah. And what you get is hydrogen chloride. Right? So this ClO2 minus is chloride polyatomic ion. And then we attach a hydrogen to it. And that's what you get. But this is why it happens. This, co this coordinate covalent bonding is why it happens that way. Now, we didn't just make this up. Right? These compounds really exist. So we go back to our first and second chapter. What we have to do, that nature just does what it does. I hadn't said that before. I'll say it again. Nature just does what it does. We investigate it, and we try to explain why it does what it does, or at least how it does it. Uh, we develop a law. We're not trying to explain why. We're just saying, yeah, it happens that way. But why is better? If we can develop a theory and explain why these things happen the way they are, that gives us a little more power, a little more information. We can branch out and, and actually use it to modify nature the way we want, actually. Organic chemists do that day in and day out. I don't know how many compounds organic chemists have made that don't occur in nature, but it, it ranges in the thousands. That's all they do. Synthetic organic chemists do that all day long, usually for companies. <clears throat> and if they if they produce a compound that's marketable, then I, I've heard it said, uh, I don't remember the man's name. He was the president of DuPont like back in the 40s, I guess, early 50s. He said, give me one research chemist to give me one good compound that I can market. And... I'll make millions of dollars off of it, and he will have earned his lifetime salary with that one product. So <clears throat> there it is if you're in business to make money. Okay. Um, this just draws a distinction between what they call regular covalent bonding versus coordinate covalent bonding. And we see in the, in the first picture that these – Electrons, one comes from one side and one comes from the other, and you share them. In the coordinate uh, example, both electrons come from one side. And notice that once you've got the XY compound formed, the bond formed, there's no way to tell how it formed. Uh, you can't tell by looking at that XY that the top one is any different than the bottom one. All right. Uh, let's see, other examples of coordinate covalent bonding. We have nitrous oxide. Right? Everybody know what nitrous oxide is? Commonly known as laughing gas. Right? Go into the dentist and have a procedure done, and you want gas instead of a lot of Novocaine. They'll let you breathe that stuff, and you won't care what they do. You'll still be awake. But they can go in there and pound around and drill and do all they want. And you just won't care. This nitrous oxide is uh, an example of a coordinate covalent compound. Right? We already drew dinitrogen in its normal state. And each nitrogen has a lone pair. So this oxygen comes in and it takes the lone pair on one side and forms a bond. Um, carbon monoxide I'm not sure how that works we want to draw it see carbon is like this right 
oxygen's like this. Yeah, like this. Now, what we would expect is maybe two of these would form a double bond. But what we also get is, um, actually, we don't know where the others come from. We assume that these lone pairs here form that third bond. But then carbon needs two, four, six, eight. It needs those, so we, we get rid of those. So really, it's just a mess, right? Carbon monoxide. We don't know which one's coordinating with which. <laughs> it's near as I can tell, it's a mess. But it doesn't it doesn't obey standard rules, except the fact that you want a an octet around each atom. Right. And carbon monoxide is 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 very, very reactive, right? as opposed to carbon dioxide. I mean, you can suffocate on carbon dioxide, right? Basically what it does is it displaces the oxygen and you don't get enough oxygen uh, in your system to live. Carbon monoxide is worse. When you've got carbon monoxide in the air at a sufficient concentration, what does it do? It latches onto your hemoglobin and won't turn loose. So there's no way that your cells can get oxygen because the hemoglobin is locked up. So your cells actually suffocate on a molecular level. Okay, a uh, coordinate covalent bond is when both electrons of a shared pair come from one of the two atoms in the bond. So we didn't do Lewis structures yet. I guess that's for today. Steps for writing Lewis structures, okay. Well, I've given you a big old taste of fluid structures already. <clears throat> now we have to go through the rules of how to write a Lewis structure. Or did we just do a Lewis dot uh, notation for individual elements? I think we did that. OK, so now we're going to write Lewis structures for compounds. OK, what you do is you take the compound that's given to you. We know this compound exists. So now we're going to try to draw a structure for it. Right. We're not just making something up, although we could, but for our purposes, we're going to take a compound, in this case, sulfur dioxide. That definitely exists. Just go over into the Greenbrier Valley, right, and roll down your windows, right, and you'll smell sulfur dioxide eventually. Right, those green sulfur springs, white sulfur springs, they don't call them sulfur springs for nothing. They stink, and it's because of sulfur. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what you do is you count the number of valence, the total number of valence electrons of all the atoms in the compound. So you look up here, sulfur, right? How many does it have? Well, it's in the same family as oxygen. It has six, right? Count from the left, six positions over. So we've got six here, but we've got oxygen there too. So that's six times two. So we've got three times six is 18. We've got 18 valence electrons that have to be positioned. Then you take the molecule, and here's the trick. you got to decide which one is the central atom. In this case, sulfur is central. It's typically the first one in the group is the central atom. So you take sulfur, and then you attach the oxygens to the sulfur with single bonds. Right. There we go. So that's two, four. We've used four electrons. So now we've got to position those 14 electrons that's left over, that are left over, around. And we start from the outside and work our way in. So we say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And once we get to the octet, we're done with the outers that we have to move in. So we got two more left, don't we? We use 12. So we have two electrons left, move into the central atom and position those two there. Okay. That is a, uh, at this point, what we've got 
is we've got an octet around oxygen on each side, but sulfur does not have an octet. So how do we make an octet without destroying the octet from these two is we form another bond. Right, we do that covalent uh, coordinate covalent trick. We take either one from either side, take these pair, put them in here for a double bond. Okay. And notice when we do that, that keeps two, four, six, eight around this oxygen and two, four, six, eight around that sulfur. Now, why didn't we use that pair for another bond? Because that wouldn't get us anywhere. Right? We'd still only have six around sulfur. Right? So we had to take two from one of these sides. Now, you could just as easily go from the other side right, and do it from this side. And those are both valid Lewis dot structures. Okay. So that's what this uh, this next set of slides are going to tell you. Just what I told you there. Uh, only they're using double pods. I like to use lines. Once they're bonded, I use a line. That way, it's easier to tell which are bonding and which are lone pairs. I think I have a yeah I have paper. Yeah, we've got. Did you uh, print off any copies of these? I did not. Okay. I've got chapter four and chapter six, but I don't have any more fives. Okay. And five is what we're in now. Okay. I'll share with you. Um, I was also, I've also got um, this extra credit. Okay. Lane compounds. I've got polyatomics. And I've got balance of energy. Did I get that one? Okay. Okay. We'll do that some more in the review session. All right. So take that review document, and that's one I'm missing also. There's a right. There's a review document that goes uh, with this. And uh, all I have now is an empty sheet. Okay. <laughs> But in the bright space, you'll find the review document. The review document is in bright space. Yes. Okay. In fact, I'll put that off ever. In fact, everything I hand out is in bright space. Okay. But if your dog eats your homework, you can get another copy easy. Yeah. Um. Okay. So let's see. Where was I? Oh, yeah. I use a line instead of two dots. That way I can, it's easy to tell the difference between bonding and, and lone pairs. So there we have, uh, hold on a second. Did I miss count? Six and six, 18, 18, two, four, four, 14, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. No, I counted right. Are we missing a, a lone pair there on sulfur? Yeah, okay. The next slide, they put it in. All right. <laughs> All right. So far, so good. And then we want to put an octet around the sulfur. So we do that by forming another bond with a pair from one of the oxygens. And we can do it from the left side or from the right side. And then um, check your numbers. Be sure you didn't create any, create any electrons. Uh, so we just count 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Okay, so we've still got the same number of electrons we started with. Valence electrons. I'm sorry. Oh, I say add another oxygen. Yeah, yeah, you can do this. Uh huh. Yeah, in fact, um, uh, your polyatomic ions. You got this is sulfur dioxide. One of your polyatomic ions is sulfite, but it gives it a charge. 
And and this and these polyatomic ions, I'm glad you brought that up. These polyatomic ions are all covalently bound atoms. Right? They're strongly bound into single units and they have a charge, but the charge is distributed over the entire unit. Uh, and you can add another oxygen too. But it gives it a two minus charge. So this is sulfate, this is sulfite. <clears throat> and you can you can draw the Lewis dot structures for these also following that same procedure. Yep. In fact, any of those polyatomic ions, you can draw the Lewis dot structures for them using this procedure. When you do that, though, if we drew the, the Lewis dot structure for this, whatever it happened to be in here, then you have to also include the charge or the structure is not complete. Because the charge tells you that uh, gives you extra electron when you do your counting, when you count up. Okay, uh, Lewis dot structure for these guys, hydrogen's easy. <laughs> That's it. Uh, fluorine. If you do fluorine, right, you've got seven on one side, seven on the other, and that's uh, 14, right, 14 total. And you put eight around one and eight around the other. The only way you can get that is to share one of the electrons. And then HF is uh, another example. All right. Ammonia is a little... A little different. Let's see how we doing on time. Okay. Been at it for an hour. Let me see. How many more slides? Am I halfway yet? No, I need to kick kick it up a little bit, don't I? So we don't eat up our lab time. <clears throat> Let's do. Well, ammonia, I showed you already. Right. Carbon dioxide, we saw that one already. How about uh, carbon tetrachloride? Anybody, anybody know what carbon tetrachloride was used for? It's a dry cleaning agent. Right? It was before OSHA and the EPA got hold of it and said you can't use it anymore. Because apparently uh, dry cleaning workers that had to handle this stuff day in and day out, they were getting sick. I mean, serious illness. So uh, OSHA and the EPA got together and said, OK, we're going to come down on this dry cleaning industry and say, you got to find another solvent that's not as hazardous. So they did. But the, the price of dry cleaning clothes went up when they did that because carbon tetrachloride is dirt cheap. And everything else is not. It's kind of like the Freon uh, problem. Anyway, carbon tetrachloride. <clears throat> so you got these. And that formula is real. It's fixed. We know that formula exists. So now what we have to do is write the structure from the formula. So how many valence electrons are carbon? Just count from the left. One, two, three, four. How about chlorine? It's seven over, isn't it? Seven valence electrons. Seven times four. Right? So um, 28 and four is 32, right? 32 electrons? Yeah. Okay, so now we put carbon in the center. It's the first one. Typically, if it's difficult to figure out which one's the central atom, look on the periodic table in the one to the left is going to be the central atom. So carbon's to the left of chlorine. So we put carbon, and then we put a single bond with each of the chlorines. So that's two, four, six, eight. We've used eight electrons. So what is that, 24? We need to position 24 more electrons working from the outside in. And so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 
21, 22, 23, 24. Okay. We used them all up. Okay, now you check for octets. Does everybody have an octet? Right. Two, four, six, eight. Carbon's good. Right. Two, four, six, eight. All the chlorines have the same. They're good. So that's it. You're done. You need to know how to do this. Why? Because we're going to use this Lewis dot structure to say something about the three-dimensional geometry of these molecules later. There you go. All right. What's the total number of dots in the Lewis structure for SO2? Okay. Interpreting what they mean by dots is bonding and non-bonding. Because I like to use lines. They like to put dots in everywhere. So the total there we calculated was 18, wasn't it? Okay. Okay. Uh, Here's, I've already told you about this. Polyatomic ions are, are covalently bonded atoms that, that have a charge for the whole group. And what they do is they enter into ionic bonding arrangements. Now that, this example is uh, potassium sulfate. So we would write potassium and sulfate which has a two minus charge. Potassium is an alkali metal, right? It's in the first group, so it has a one plus charge. But that means we need two of them. But this is an ionic compound between that ion and that ion. But this group is covalently bound. And uh, if we write the Lewis dot structure, which they've done for us there, They've got the sulfate with its two minus charge. When you write the Lewis dot structure, potassium had one electron in its valence shell. So it's got no more dots. Right? It's just formed the ion. And the sulfate ion has a two minus charge. And inside the brackets is the correct structure. Right? Sulfur's got an octet. Every oxygen's got an octet. We could go through the same procedure and write that sulfate structure. So why do you put it in brackets? Uh, because the charge, the two minus charge, mm -hmm. is assigned to the whole unit, gotcha. not to individual atoms. And that's why they showed you the one on the right, which would be an incorrect structure. Because gotcha. it claims that there are uh, the whole molecule is covalently bound, but it's not. It's an ionic compound with covalent parts. Okay. Uh, how many valence electrons are present in the polyatomic ion sulfate? Well, let's see, sulfur and oxygen are in the same group, so they're six electrons each, six valence, and there are five of them. Five times six is 32, plus two minus charge. Excuse me, uh, four, five, no, five times eight is Five times six is 30, plus the two minus is 32. Got to confuse everybody. We've got a sulfur and we've got oxygen. And sulfur is in the same family as oxygen, so it's got the same valence electrons. It's got six. So we've got six here and six here. So that's four plus one is five. Five times six is 30. But this charge contributes two more electrons. So it's got a total of 32 electrons. Everybody see that? Circular nods. Yeah. Maybe it'll dawn on you sometime in the future. Okay. So the reason we need to know something about the molecular geometry, what's the three-dimensional shape here, is it allows us to imply polarity. That is, does this grouping, this covalently bound grouping, does it possess any slight um, repositioning of electrons to give it a slight charge, right? Not a complete charge, just a, just a slight uh, polarity. 
And we need to know the three-dimensional structure in order to determine that. So the theory that we're using is called VSEPR. That stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. And that's 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 an acronym for for a, a big set of words that just means that once we've established the Lewis dot structure, then around a central atom, we can arrange those other atoms in such a way that the repulsion forces are minimized. So you want to position the electron pairs and the bonded atoms uh, as far apart from each other as possible. And we're talking about regular geometric structures. So um, what you, we need some examples. <laughs> You want to separate those electron groups as far apart as possible so that you minimize their repulsion, right? Because they're all negatively charged, right? In the bonds and the lone pairs. So in order to do that, um, you need to, uh, some knowledge of what regular three-dimensional geometric structures are available to us. Now, one thing we have to realize is when we draw these structures, um, if you've got a single bond between two atoms, we treat that as a group. If you've got a double bond between two atoms, it's the same. It's just a group. So we treat single, double, and triple bonds the same way around a central atom. Okay. First thing you do is draw the Lewis structure. Okay. Practice drawing the structures. Once you've got that structure, then you you home in on the central atom. Now we've up to this point we've just been doing very simple structures where there's only one central atom. But if you got these big molecules, sometimes you've got a central atom here, you got a central atom there and there, and each of them have different Lewis dot structures around each one of them, which gives them a different geometry. But we're going to start off simple with just one central atom in the molecule and draw the structure then you take that central atom let's see um let's take um sulfur dioxide because i think i can remember why we drew that one i had a lone pair here and let's say we put the double bond on that side correct and we put the single bond on this side oops There we go. Okay. Once you've got the dot structure for SO2, then you take the central atom and you count the, the groups, the lone pairs and the bonding uh, and the bonds. We've got one, two, three. Okay. Remember, we count that one as a single group. Count this one as a single group and lone pairs stand by themselves. So we've got three groups around that sulfur. Okay. What's well, a regular shape for three things positioned around something in the center? If we have a Y and a Y and a Y, the farthest apart you can get them is at the points of an equilateral triangle. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we would do with this one. We would say sulfur. We would have lone pair here. We would have an oxygen here and oxygen there like this. And that would be one of our possible um, three-dimensional electronic shapes. Okay, There's a difference between an electronic configuration and a molecular configuration. The molecular configuration goes the next step. Cover up a lone pair and say, I mean, what do the bonds actually do? Right? We have an equilateral triangle here with this, this, and this, but if you're only interested in the bonds between atoms, that's a bent molecule. Okay, see what I'm saying? We go step by step. No dot structure. Count the number of groups. What's the regular shape for that number of groups? And then 
you cover up the the lone pairs and say, all right, what's left? What's left is actually the bonded atoms. And the arrangement here in the bonded atoms is a bent molecule. Okay, that's where we're headed. Uh, let's see. So on yep. the oxygen on this side, it has three, three sets? Like lone three, pairs. Three lone pairs? Uh -huh. Why wouldn't that third one be also a lone pair? Because the other side only has two. We're only interested in the central atom. Gotcha. What's okay. the geometry around the central atom? Okay. Now, if there were other atoms bonded off here, mm -hmm. then we could treat this and say, what's the geometry around that one? Gotcha. Okay. So when the molecules get bigger, that's what you do. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me try another example. Does everyone know what hydrogen peroxide formula is? H2O2. So that 30%, no, 3%, excuse me, 3% hydrogen peroxide in your medicine cabinet is composed of a solution of that compound. And when it decomposes, it decomposes into water and oxygen. And oxygen is deadly to most microorganisms, disease-causing microorganisms. That's why one of the treatments for uh, sewage is aeration. Right. At some point, they take it and they just spray it up into the air and get lots of oxygen in there. It kills off the disease-causing bacteria, especially the anaerobics, right? the ones that like to live in no-oxygen environments, you know, like clostridium. It right? causes uh, botulism. Right? Get rid of those. <clears throat> okay, so back to this one. So what would be the Lewis dot structure for this one? Well, let's see, we've got two, we've got one electron each here, so that's two. And oxygen's got six each, right? Six each, so that's 12 total. So we have 14 electrons total. Valence electrons that we have to position for that molecule. Right? Six valence for each of these, which is 12. One for each of these, which is two, total is 14. So we attach the oxygens and we attach the hydrogens like that with single bonds. Two, four, six, minus six. That means eight electrons left. Right? We can't put any more around hydrogen because it only accepts two total. And it's already got two. So we got to move into the oxygens. So eight would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we counted up 14 electrons. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. Hydrogens have their duets. Oxygens have their octets. Now, what's the shape? Well, we've got, we've got two central atoms, right? What's the shape around this one? What's the shape around that one? They actually should be the same because they, they're, they're structured the same way. So you have one, two, three, four groups. Four groups around that oxygen. So... What's the regular shape for four groups? Right. This is a hard one, I know. I'm sorry. Is it a square? Uh -uh. No. No, a square puts them far apart, but they can get farther apart if they're in a tetrahedron. Right. If you've got um, a triangle in the bottom and then up here to to that shape, like uh, a, a triangular base pyramid, a tetrahedron, is the best way to get those one, two, three, four groups farthest apart from each other that you can. So we put the oxygen in the middle, and then we, we form a bond, that to one oxygen and this to the other hydrogen, and then we have a lone pair in the back and a lone pair up here. So if we turn it over on its side, we've got these two lone pairs out here, and then we've got this oxygen here and this hydrogen here. So the, the electronic structure is tetrahedral, but the molecular structure is bent. 
Okay, you go from here to here to here. That's a bent molecule. So what we typically do when we write this in structural form is if we go, uh, let's see, we go here, oxygen, oxygen, and hydrogen, like that. And then we put in our lone pairs. So that shows you that this part is bent, this part is bent the other direction, and that gets this one as far away from, if you put it down here, it's too close to this one and too close to these. So if you bend it that way and this one this way, that gets them as far apart from each other as possible. Um, let me see, do I have a list? All right, there's another, uh, we did the sulfur dioxide already. It's, they call it angular, I like bent. So um, H2CO, formaldehyde. Everybody, everybody knows what formaldehyde smells like, correct? <laughs> That's its structure. That's what's impinging on your olfactories. Um, so it's it's a triangular, a um, trigonal planar. So if we have this equilateral triangle, the proper name for it in chemical terms is trigonal planar. That just means all the atoms are in the same plane and they're in a triangle. <laughs> um, methane is another example of a tetrahedron. Only this one is molecular tetrahedral because it has the four groups around the carbon, but they're no lone pairs. So the electronic structure is the same as the molecular structure. But um, ammonia has that extra lone pair. Right? Just dry out the structure. You'll find it's got that lone pair with those three bonds with the hydrogens. So the tetrahedral uh, electronic structure for ammonia gives way to a trigonal pyramid, the molecular structure. Just cover up the lone pair. What do you got left? There it is. Uh, water is tetrahedral electronic structure. In fact, all of these are tetrahedral electronic structure. But water, because it has two lone pairs, Cover those up, what do you got left? You got hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. You got a bent molecule. And this, we're going to use this information to determine whether a molecule is polar or not, whether it has a negative side and a positive side, because that affects how they react with one another and with other compounds that we try to uh, put them together with. So when they use the dotted line, what does that mean versus the... Oh, yeah, the way they write that. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's do ammonia. Like ammonia's got this lone pair up here, and they've used a dotted line like that, and they've used uh, a solid line like that. Sometimes they color it in. And then this one is just a line. If it's just a line, they're saying that the nitrogen and the hydrogen are in the same plane okay. on the board. The dotted line means that hydrogen's behind the board, and this triangular, a solid triangular, is in front of the board. We borrowed that from organic chemistry. So if you got plans to go into organic chemistry, this will be good information when you finally get there. No. <laughs> no. He said, I'm not a glutton for punishment. Okay. Um, so when molecules have more than one central atom, uh, the one we just showed you was hydrogen peroxide, but acetylene is an example. Um, hydrogen azide is a, a, an example. Um, you, you approach each central atom separately. And a geometry exists around each of those central atoms. Now, acetylene, notice acetylene has no lone pairs. Right? So if you've got two groups around a central atom, 
what's the farthest you can get those groups from each other? It's linear, right, on either side of the atom. So the way acetylene is written right there is the molecular structure. Right? It's got two groups. It's linear. Um, hydrogen peroxide, though, it's got some lone pairs, so it does what we showed it there earlier. Um, the nitrogens in azide are different from one another. Those two nitrogens have bonds on either side. We don't care about the one on the end because it has no bonds to it. It, it doesn't have a, well, it does have an electronic structure, but we can't give it a molecular structure because there's nothing on the other side. So we're only interested in those two central nitrogens. The one on, on your left is uh, three groups. So it's an electronic uh, trigonal planar or bent molecular because we covered up that lone pair. Whereas the other nitrogen, it has two groups. It's linear. It's linear both electronic and molecular because there are no lone pairs. See, so you can get two different structures, uh, one for one and one for the other central atom. Okay. Um, what this slide tells you, and it this, I don't know if this came out of your book or not. Does it have that in your chapter five? Anyway, if it doesn't, the reason I put this in here is to um, give you some information. What do you do when you count up the number of groups around a central atom? Where do you go for your regular geometry? This side probably got more room. So if we have... Uh, the number of groups here and the, let's see, let's make it a small e. The electronic geometry, and then you can go to molecular geometry. So if you have two groups here, the electronic geometry is going to be linear. That's what that first one shows you, linear. If you have three, then the electronic geometry is going to be trigonal planar, right? That equilateral triangle. If you have four groups, you're going to have a tetrahedron. Okay. Now, if you have five groups, this is one we haven't talked about yet. What you do is you take um, a trigonal pyramid and you put the bases together. Uh, so you have a trigonal pyramid, trigonal pyramid, slap the bases together, and that's your regular shape. It's a trigonal bipyramid. Bipyramid. What you're looking at is the triangular base here, and then you're looking at something up here and something down here. Right? So if you draw connecting lines like that, then you have your, your trigonal base in the middle, and the pyramid this way and the pyramid mirror image the other way. That's the most efficient way to arrange uh, five groups around a central atom. Okay. And then six. This is as far as we're going to go. You can go higher, but I'm not going to go any higher. This one is octahedral. It's like the trigonal pyramid, only that central Instead of a triangle, it's a square. And then you have a position up here and a position down here. And if you count the sides, right, if, you, if you draw your square kind of oblique like this, and you position something up here and something down here, then you draw the sides like that, like that. You draw down here like that, here, here, here. Count the sides. You've got four sides here and four sides here. That's octahedron. Remember your geometry? Does everybody have geometry? Yeah. Right. Geometry, three-dimensional geometry counts the number of sides and names the number of sides. So octahedron. Right. You can, I don't know, can you have a heptahedron, seven-sided? You can have a six. I think you can have six. 
And if you have, you can have a hexahide uh, eater. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So that's what you do when you have this number of groups. This is the electronic geometry. Now, the molecular geometry depends on the number of lone pairs. Right. It doesn't make any sense here if you have a lone pair. It's, I mean, lone pairs, it's going to be linear either way. It's, it's linear that way. If there's a lone pair out here, just throw it out. You're still linear, right? So that's a, a what do they call it? Non sequitur. Can't remember my lab. Trigonal planar, though, if you've got uh, one lone pair, what does that do? Well, that makes a bent molecule, doesn't it? What if you have two lone pairs? Two pairs makes linear. Right? Because you got you got the triangular shape. But if two of them are linear, then it's only the central atom bound to one. So it's linear. You don't see that? I see frowns. <laughs> right? If you've got a, a trigonal planar here and say here, and then you've got something over here with the central atom. Let's make this a Y, actually. Y. Make this one X. Then you got your trigonal planar shape, but the bonds actually occur here, right? So if you cover these up, what do you got? It's linear. All right, tetrahedral. If you got like ammonia, if you got one lone pair, then you have the trigonal pyramid, right? Trigonal pyramid. Now right, you cover up that top and you got nitrogen with hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. It's a triangular shaped pyramid. If you've got two lone pairs, then you've got a bent molecule. Right? And if you've got three lone pairs, you're linear again. How about trigonal bipyramid? So I have to draw this one out. Right? You go like that, you go like this, and you have a central atom here. And um, of course, if you've got every position has an atom in it, then you're still trigonal pyramid. But if you've got one lone pair, question is, which one of these pairs, where do you put the pair? Right, to make the most sense. Well, this has to be, the information here comes from experimentation. And what they've discovered is that the lone pair, if you've only got one lone pair, it's on the triangle. Okay, so if you're bonding here, bonding to something there, bonding to something here, bonding to something there, and bonding to something here, right? turn that on its side, this becomes that, right? You got the X here, and you got Y here, and you got Y here, and then you got this one and this one. You got a Y over here and Y over here, and your lone pair was over here. So what you end up with there, if you've got one lone pair, is a seesaw. Now, if you have two lone pairs, the other lone pair is going to be here. Right there. So for that one, you have a T-shape. Right? You just take one of these away. Right? It's another lone pair. Take it away, and you got T-shape. Okay? And if you have three lone pairs, that third one is also going to be on the triangle. Now you're linear again. Okay? linear. Okay, the last one is octahedral. Let's see. Uh, this just does electronic. Do I have... Yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, so, if we go now to... Uh, yeah, okay. We're good so far. We've gone uh, through the trigonal bipyramid, and we've introduced lone pairs, one, two, and three. And that gets us these possibilities here, seesaw, T-shape, and linear. Then we go to octahedral. Oh, not going to do octahedral? Oh, we got to do octahedral.
So if we have octahedral, we have our square base, and we have our central atom, and then we have something here and something here. Right. So where would the uh, lone pair be on this one? Well, as it turns out, the lone pair for this arrangement is best up there. And this is experimental data. Right? I'm not making this up. So one lone pair gives you what? A square pyramid. Right? Just like the Egyptian pyramids. That's what it looks like. Cover that up. There's the base. And then you form a bond here, there, 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 there. And the shape is, turn it over, square pyramid. If you have another lone pair, two pair, it will go down here. So now what are you left with? Square planar. Right. Square planar. Um, I guess you could put another lone pair, maybe, but it would have to go here. In which case you would have, um, looks like another seesaw, doesn't it? This one out here, out here, out here. Well, that's T-shaped, isn't it? If you have three, it goes this way and that way. So that would be, with three pairs, it would be T-shaped. That's as far as we're going. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Determine the shape for each of the following molecules and what's their bond angles. All right. I didn't mention bond angles before. But if you have a linear shape and the mole the when we say bond angles, you got to go all the way to molecular geometry. Because lone pairs aren't bonding. You got to have some bonds to deal with before you can do bond angles. And that's bond angle around the central atom. So if it's linear, that one should be easy. Right? If you got X and, uh, and Y, let's say X and Y like that, what's the bond angle? Well, the bond angles with this at the apex, and you move from here to there, 180, right? 180 degrees. How about trigonal planar? If you've got all three positions occupied by atoms, then there's your bond, there's a bond, and there's a bond. So what's this bond angle? How many how many degrees in it in a triangle inside the triangle? Well, let's see. Uh, but complete circle would be 360, wouldn't it? So a third of 360 is 120. 120 degree bond angle. Now, if you're thinking about the, the triangle itself, right, we know what that means, right? 60 degrees. But we're talking about bond angle. The bond angle is 120 degrees. So, if you have a, a, a bent molecule from this arrangement, like you turn that into a lone pair, this would nominally be 120 degrees. But, Lone pair electrons are not confined by the the uh, two atoms on either side, keeping them in check in the bond. Right? If you've got a lone pair, what a lone pair tends to do is say, "There's nobody over there, right? I, um, Mom's gone and Grandma's down here. She's letting me do what I want to, so I just go." And the the electron density spreads on a lone pair, so this lone pair will put pressure on these bonds and decrease it like maybe 115 or 110 degrees. So it'd be less than 120. But nominally for this structure, it's 120 degrees for that bond angle for a bent molecule. And then of course the linear molecule is, is a no brainer. All right, how about tetrahedral? All right, this is the one you just have to memorize. What's the bond angle in a tetrahedral molecule? So if we have uh, X in the middle, and we put something up here and something down here in the back and over here and over here so we can form a triangular base like that. Well, the bonding takes place here, 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 and here. 
So what's the bond angle on all, and they're equal bond angles in a tetrahedral. If all the positions, the points of the tetrahedron are occupied by atoms, then the bond angle here is 109.5 degrees. Okay. That's the only one you really have to memorize. So, um, if in the tetrahedron you get a bent molecule, Right for um, one, let's see, one lone pair. Oh, one lone pair is trigonal pyramid. So for ammonia, if we had it going that there, then these bonds down here would be 109.5. Actually, they'd be less, right? Because that lone pair kind of balloons, puts pressure on the others, so it'd be a little less, like 108, something like that. But for water, if you've got uh, two lone pairs in water, and you got oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen. It's got two lone pairs out here doing that thing, and it's putting even more pressure, so the bond would shrink from 109.5 to maybe 107. Uh, trigonal bipyramid. So if we got a trigonal bipyramid like this, and we got something up here and something down here, and we've got X in the middle. And we've got Y's over here, no lone pairs yet. All right. What bond angles do you have there? You got a bond here, a bond there, you got a bond here, bond here, a bond here. Well, the internal bond here between that Y and this Y on that X at the apex is the same as a trigonal planar. Right? It's 120 degrees. How about this one with this one, right? That one, that one. 90 degrees, the right angle, okay? How about this one with that one? 180. So those are, you have three possibilities in here. 90, 120, 180. And then if you just make long pairs, then uh, whatever's left. Okay. Uh, octahedral is the one that's left. Okay, here's octahedral. Uh, what do you have here? All right, there's a. Let's say we have we have a Y here and a Y here. You got a bond there. You got a bond here. What's that angle? Ninety degrees. Everybody see that? All right. Ninety times four is what? Three sixty. That's how you know. 360. How about this one with one of these others? They're all essentially the same. Right? That's another 90 degrees. Right? Come down here, out to the square. 90 degrees. How about this one with this one? 180. Okay. So the octahedral, you only have two options, 90 and 180. All right. That's enough of that. I, I can see some brains being scrambled. This uh, three-dimensional stuff, if I had models, it'd probably be easier to follow. Molecular models could set them up. But most molecular models are... are uh, um, arrangements, the pieces are set up so that you make organic molecules, right? And they're a little narrower in their focus, right? If we were going to do a model for like this, you would need a, a big set with central atoms that had different whole arrangements. And they're kind of expensive. I think we have some molecular models there if you want to fool with them <clears throat> somewhere. But time is limiting. Let's see. We need to get into the lab at 10.55 or 11, so I don't have much time left. All right, so um, this trigonal pyramid for ammonia, remember, it's derived from the tetrahedron, which is 109.5, but that lone pair presses the bonds down right, and decreases their angle. And as it turns out, it's 107 degrees. Uh, ozone is a bent molecule. We don't have time to go into that now. Take my word for it. 
but the, the bond angles are 120 degrees. Okay, the topic of electronegativity. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, without using that name, I mentioned the uh, differential attraction of electrons in a bond by two different elements. So if you have nitrogen and oxygen together, oxygen is going to be a stronger pull. It's more electronegative than nitrogen. So it pulls some of the electron density in that bond toward itself and polarizes the bond. So in that case, you would have something like this and maybe something else out here. It doesn't matter. But for the bond itself, since oxygen is more electronegative, it acquires on this end of the bond, it acquires a slight negative charge. And this acquires a slight positive charge. That's the Greek letter delta, the little delta, not the big delta, not that one, the little one. And what that means is it's not a complete charge, it's a slight charge. The other way that we can represent that is to show with an arrow which direction the electron density favors. And in this case, it would go this direction. And we show the positive end like this. So that's known as a... As a uh, uh, My mind's gone blank. It'll come to me later. But in order to, to determine the polarity of a bond, you need to have an idea of the arrangement of polarity in the periodic table. And the electronegativity in the periodic table increases from lower left to upper right. So the, the least electronegative atoms in the periodic table are down cesium. And the most electronegative is fluorine. We don't include the um, noble gases uh, because they're happy the way they are. They can care less. So there's an example. Uh, rubidium, they don't go down to cesium. Cesium is pretty close to rubidium. It's, it may be 0 0.7, 0 0.7. Now, these numbers are on uh, on a scale that's actually derived from a, a mathematical formula. Derived, it was created by Linus Pauling. And uh, it's, it's the most commonly used one. So rubidium is 0 0.8 and fluorine is 4. So if you if you form a bond between rubidium and fluorine, it's first of all, it's going to be ionic, right? Because it's a metal nonmetal. But we can say something about the polarity of the bond too, even though it's ionic. Is you just subtract the smaller number from the larger number, and that gives you an indication as to the polarity of the bond. It's more effective when you do it with nonmetals. Like if we formed a bond between carbon and fluorine, right? That would be four for fluorine and two and a half for carbon, two point five from four is 1.5, right? So 1.5 is a very, very polar bond. All right. So that's the general trend from lower left to upper right. If we look at um, moving left to right, right we're just in a, in a period. We're moving from left to right. How do we explain the increase in polarity for the atoms, say, in a single period. So I go from sodium to chlorine. The electronegativity increases from left to right, right? From sodium to chlorine, it's, it's increasing stepwise. Well, why is that? Well, you know that the electrons in that period are in a particular uh, principal quantum number, in a shell, right? And that there, there are no added shells, right? It's just that shell. But what are you doing to the nucleus? Well, you're adding electrons to the shell, but you're adding protons to the nucleus. You're increasing the effective nuclear charge of the nucleus. You're making it more and more and more positive. Even though you're adding electrons, they're at the same energy level. So as you're increasing the positive charge on the nucleus, you're drawing those, um, you're increasing the differential between the, the negative charge and the positive charge in the nucleus. And that effectively increases the nuclear charge, the positive charge, which increases its attraction for electrons. 
And actually what happens is the atom shrinks. You're increasing the number of protons with these electrons out here at the same energy level. They tend to shrink. So actually, when you go from left to right, you're decreasing the size of the atom, too. But you're increasing the electronegativity by adding protons. Top to bottom is a little different. Right? If you go from bottom to top, what are you doing? Well, as you're going from the bottom to the top, you're moving through various periods or energy levels. Right. And you're, you're doing like, like this, you're shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And what that does is it exposes more of the positive charge in the nucleus. It's called shielding. You're removing the shielding of the negative charges from around the nucleus as you go up. And by removing those core electrons and the shielding that they offer, then you're exposing um, uh, any electrons that are outside the atom to more and more positive charge as you move up. Or you can look at it the other way. As you go down, you're adding more shielding electrons uh, to energy levels, and that uh, decreases the effective nuclear charge as you go down. So you decrease the electronegativity down, you increase it going up. So the trend is from left to right is increase. From bottom to top is increased, and you put them both together, lower left to upper right, you increase the electronegativity. All right. Um, if lithium and fluorine react, which element will have more attraction for electrons? I have to do is look at their relative position. Right? Lithium's way over here, fluorine's way over there in the same period. Fluorine has a higher electronegative electronegativity it's going to have the stronger attraction. Okay. Um, in a bond between fluorine and iodine, which you can form, right? fluorine's here, iodine's a halogen further down, right? you're decreasing its electronegativity as you go down the period. So, again, fluorine is going to be the more electronegative and have the stronger attraction for that reason. So which one of these has the highest electronegativity? Well, we throw helium out because it's a noble gas. It doesn't count. And you look at the positions, right? Hydrogen, oxygen, chlorine. Well, chlorine is below hydrogen and oxygen. So oxygen probably has the most electronegativity of the group. Yeah, and, and in fact, when we measure it, it does have the most electronegative element of that group. So once we know the electronegativity, we can say something about bond polarity. Right? If, if a bond forms and you've got two different elements, you can say something about not just is it polar, but how polar is it? And like I said before, the greater the difference, the more polar it is. And we can do that numerically if we know the values from Pauling's uh, electronegativities. We know that uh, if the if bond is composed is between two atoms of the same element, then it's sufficiently nonpolar. It's a nonpolar covalent bond. Two hydrogens would satisfy that condition. Polar covalent, example here, is between hydrogen and chlorine. They're sufficiently far apart in their electronegativities, not to be ionic, but to be covalent and yet polar. Uh, okay, so there are the symbols. Right. That, uh, that arrow is one way of describing the polarity of the bond. It shows which direction the electrons tend to move toward the chlorine. Either way is is uh, sufficient. Now, what this chart tells you is uh, when you can calculate the difference between electronegativities uh, and you get a value between those two numbers, right? Subtract the smaller from the larger. That value is on this scale. If the value is is uh, less than 0.4, it's a nonpolar covalent. 
Right? So those atoms must be very close to each other in the periodic table. If it's between 0.4 and 1.5, then we know it's polar covalent. There's an unequal sharing, though, of electrons. Uh, the gray area is between 1.5 and 2. If you can subtract those electric negativities and get something between 1.5 and, and 2, then you have to say, all right, is it uh, two nonmetals? If it's two nonmetals, it's still polar covalent. But if it's a metal and a nonmetal, then we call it ionic. And, of course, if it's greater than two, there's no, no, uh, no tiebreaker there. It's ionic, pure and simple. All right. All right, I'm going to run out of time. Um, arrange the following bonds in the descending order of polarity. That is most polar, polar to least polar. So the top one should be easy because uh, we've got three different elements bound with a fluorine. All right, so which one is closest to the fluorine on the periodic table? That would be the least polar. It looks like oxygen is the closest, so it would be the least polar. Oxygen and fluorine. The most polar would be the furthest apart, right? which would be carbon and fluorine. Oops, wrong symbol. The other direction. And then nitrogen and fluorine would be in the middle. That was fairly easy. So from most to least, carbon and fluorine, least oxygen and fluorine. The second one is a little more difficult because here you've got different atoms bound together. So you have to look at what's the spread, what's the difference between them on the periodic chart. Carbon and fluorine is pretty far apart. How about nitrogen and fluorine? That's closer. Uh, nitrogen and oxygen, excuse me, they're very close together. Uh, silicon and fluorine, they're a little farther apart, actually, than carbon. So silicon and fluorine would be the most polar. And the least polar would be too close together, nitrogen and oxygen. And then what's left over? Carbon and fluorine should be in the middle. So from... Descending order, we have silicon, carbon, nitrogen. The last one, chlorine, chlorine, would be way over here on the right. But it's not even polar at all. And then boron and chlorine are pretty far apart. How about sulfur and chlorine? They're very close together. So sulfur and chlorine would be in the middle. And then boron and chlorine would be the most polar. Simply because of their, their difference in uh, their distance from each other in the periodic table. All right. Which would the following would be the least polar yet still be considered polar covalent? All right. The way to handle this is all right, are there any in there that are ionic? All right. If it's going to be polar covalent, it can't be ionic. Magnesium and oxygen, right. We throw those out. Uh, how about uh, oxygen and oxygen? Right? It can't be polar because they're two oxygens. So we really only have to deal with carbon, silicon, and nitrogen. And the least polar are the, the pair that's closest together. So nitrogen and oxygen is very close together. Silicon is further apart. Carbon's further apart. So silicon and oxygen would be the least polar yet polar covalent. Wait a minute. Oh, excuse me. I should have said nitrogen and oxygen. They're the closest together. Why did I say silicon? I don't know. Nitrogen and oxygen are still polar covalent, but they're the least polar of, uh, of that selection. Which would be the most polar without being considered ionic? Well, we want to throw out oxygen, oxygen, and magnesium oxygen and say the most polar would be silicon and oxygen. They're the furthest apart, right? 
All right. So we what we've talked about so far is polarity of the bonds. Now we're gonna we're gonna meld bond polarity and molecular three dimensional molecular structure together to see what's the characteristic character of the entire molecule. Okay. And in order to do that, we need both the molecular geometry and bond polarities. Right. If the bonds are not polar in your molecule, none of them are polar, then you can stop there. The molecule will not be polar. It'll be nonpolar molecule. If the bonds are polar, then you have to uh, use the geometry to determine, is there a net to the, the polar bonds? <clears throat> we call that uh, vector analysis. In other words, does anybody know what a vector is? A vector is an arrow. In physics, vectors are used often for forces, right? When you have, when you have forces opposing each other, and you have, say, a force, uh, they're both, forces are, are both anchored at that point. What's the total force on that point? Well, we take, we take this, and we go down here like this, and the total force is in that direction, that amount. Okay, that's vector analysis. And all it tells us is that you don't need, you don't need to know only the, the force, the pull of those electronegativities in the bond, you need to know their directions, right? So what would be the vector, of, the vector sum of this force and that force? Zero, because they're pulling the same in opposite directions. So the vector force would be zero. So think about that in terms of your bonds. If you have a linear bond and you have a polar bond like this one, carbon dioxide is linear. Like that. <clears throat> Oxygen is more polar than carbon, right? So we have a polar bond here and we have a polar bond there. But the bonds are equivalent in their polarity. They cancel out. So for that molecule, it is nonpolar. Even though it has polar bonds, they pull the same amount in opposite directions. The molecule is nonpolar. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. You add up the vector sums. For something like um, ammonia, right? it has one in the back. It has a hydrogen out here, it has a hydrogen out there. Actually, this, this one would probably be like, uh, to be consistent, probably be like that. <laughs> so, and it has a lone pair up here. So what's the polarity on this bond? Well, nitrogen is more polar than hydrogen, slightly. So it would be like that, like that, like that, with, with equal polarities of the bonds. Plus, it has this lone pair up here that gives it a nice big negative. So when you add them all together, you get an overall polarity in that direction. So ammonia is a polar molecule. All right. So in order to determine the polarity of a molecule, you need to know two things. Are the bonds polar? And what's its geometry? I showed you this one already. That's a nonpolar molecule. Water. Water is a polar molecule. Right. You see the polarity of the bonds uh, toward oxygen from both sides. But they're not opposing one another. They're kind of offset. So the overall for water is a vector this direction. So water is a polar molecule it tends to dissolve other polar molecules very easily or ionics like sodium chloride or uh, polar molecules, molecules with polar dangles <laughs> like sugar. 
Sugar has lots of polar dangles, lots of OH groups on it. And that makes it those bonds polar, and that allows for the uh, attraction of this slightly negative side and slightly positive sides here. Let's see. Let's make that two. That way, its polarity says that even in pure water, it's going to line up so that the hydrogens of other water molecules are like that. Right? And you form that, what we call the hydrogen bond between this one and that one. For that reason, water is liquid at room temperature, right? In most temperatures on the surface of the earth. Right? If it were not that case, <clears throat> If water were not a polar, if it was a nonpolar molecule, uh, at these temperatures and pressures, water would be a vapor. Right? We'd be in big trouble. Okay, uh, hydrogen cyanide is that other molecule, and the polar bonds there, uh, hydrogen carbon is toward the carbon, carbon nitrogen is toward the nitrogen. Add those up, and you get a, a linear molecule, but it's still polar toward the nitrogen side of the molecule. And that affects the way it behaves with its neighbors, its other cyanide molecules, or with anything else we want to put in there with it. Uh, if you've heard the expression, like dissolves like, okay, that's what they mean. Polar molecules, polar solvents dissolve polar solutes. And nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. All right. Um, we're going to have to skip that one. We're going to have to skip this one, too. That's the only. Which of the following molecules are polar? Those two. Those three. There we go. <laughs> uh, how about polar compounds here? Well, carbon dioxide we know is nonpolar. We did that one already. Water is polar. Methane is not polar. How about beryllium chloride? Well, let's see. Beryllium is a metal and chlorine is a nonmetal. Right? So it, it should actually be ionic. So we can't say anything polar about it. Right? So water is the only polar non-covalent -co uh, molecule in that group. Okay. Uh, all right, we talked about this uh, naming um, binary molecular compounds right, last week, where we had type 1, type 2, and type 3. Remember that? Please remember that. Type 1s were what? They were metal and non-metal, right? and the metal is a fixed, fixed charge, type 2. You better be practicing these. It's also a metal and a non-metal, but the metal in this case is a variable charge. So when we name it, we have to say what the charge is, like um, uh, this one. We would say iron two is a two plus charge uh, oxide. Okay, and type three, type three were the nonmetals with nonmetals, and for those you just need the formula like um, that one, and you say how many of them are there? All right, one carbon. The first one, if the first one is singular, we don't say mono, just say carbon. Then we say two oxygens, dioxide. Okay. That's what we're talking about here. This binary molecular compound is a type three for naming purposes. So we don't have to spend a lot of time with this one. What you do have to know is the Greek prefixes, one through ten. Right. Uh, mono, di. Tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. 
Those are the Greek prefixes that tell you the numbers of atoms that are in the molecule. Oh, there they are again. Okay. Uh, some, some compounds have common names, right? And we, we go with that, right? Water is dihydrogen monoxide. Um, hydrogen peroxide is called hydrogen peroxide because it's like this. This is peroxide when you have two oxygens bound together. So you can put anything out here. This is hydrogen peroxide. You could put um, you could put dimethyl peroxide. Or or anything. It's still a peroxide. Ammonia is a common name, right? NH3. It's like uh, uh, nitrogen trihydride is ammonia. Hydrazine. N2H4. What was hydrazine used for? The Nazis worked with it a lot in their rocket engines. Hydrazine. It's very, very dangerous. Lots of ground crew died using it. <laughs> uh, methane, CH4. When, when we're talking about methane and those um, uh, hydrocarbons, the series of hydrocarbons, and these are uh, uh, shoot, I hate it when that happens. Anyway, these are organic compounds. So one carbon and hydrogen with its hydrogens is methane, two carbons is uh, is uh, methane, ethane, three is propane. Right, so the propane in the tank that you barbecue with is three carbons and hydrogens. All right, so those are this is an organic way of naming things. Well, there's that thing right there. N2O, nitrous oxide, dinitrogen monoxide would be the systematic name. Nitric oxide would be uh, nitrogen monoxide. Right, we hear nit nitric oxide in, in the news all the time. It's an effective, um, if it's in your diet or something in your diet can produce nitric oxide, it will dilate your blood vessels and decrease your blood pressure. Right, so that's why, that's the basis upon which they sell super beets. Beets are supposed to produce nitric oxide when you digest them. They actually have lots of nitrites in them. But you know, when they go into your digestive system, it converts it into nitric oxide that goes into your system and dilates your vessels. It works. It just doesn't last very long. So I'd have to have to be eating uh, those little chewies, super beet chewies, like like one every 30 minutes to get a, a, an effect through the whole day. OK, so these are named with a type three convention, right? That's the one that's incorrect. Phosphorus pentoxide, it should be diphosphorus pentoxide. The rest are correct. All right, I'm out of time, so we're gonna have to skip the uh, concept questions. All right, and well, does anybody need to take a break before we get into the lab? If you do, now's the time. Okay. Today we're going to, we're going to do, uh, A series of experiments determining density of different materials. We're only going to determine the density of uh, solids and liquids. We're not going to do gases today. So um, some of these methods are not intuitive. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> 
All right. So uh, first of all, before we get into the pre-lab uh, questions, and you can, if you've already done those, and I hope you have, then you can check yourself against what we're talking about. First of all, density. How do we define density? Equals what? It's a formula. Mass divided by volume, correct. Mass divided by the volume of that mass. So that makes it an intensive property. That is, it doesn't matter how much of the substance we have, its density will stay constant. Right? We could have uh, um, a solid gold ring at certain density. We could have, which I'd like, one of those big bars of gold. And it will have the same density. Right? It's an intensive property. <clears throat> and th that's, that's where we focus our attention for the entire lab. For liquids, we report density in masses and grams, and volume is in milliliters. Okay, that's volume. For solids, we typically report them as grams per cubic centimeter, which numerically is the same. Right? Cubic centimeters and milliliters are exactly the same size. So it's just a convention. So how do you determine, let's see, is that example worth stopping on? Yeah, that's a good problem. That example problem. Or do we have one here? No, we don't have one in, in the pre lab questions, I don't think. Oh, wait a minute, it goes on. Yeah, we do have. Okay, I'm going to skip that. So how do you determine the mass of anything? It's, it's too simple. Use a balance, right? Yeah, use a balance. So we're going to use our platform balances, right? the electronic balances. You don't have to use the triple beams for this one. We'll make it easy on you. Uh, so you determine mass on the balance. How do you determine the volume? It depends. If you have a liquid, right, you just pour it into some measuring device and, and read it. In, in our case, we're going to determine the density of um, isopropyl alcohol, right, rubbing alcohol, or this is pure. So you put it in your uh, 10 milliliter volumetric uh, graduated cylinder uh, and read the volume off of it. But how do you get the mass? How do you get the mass of a liquid? I mean, you can't pour the liquid into the balance. <laughs> you get it by difference. Right? You need to know the, the mass of the container. Then measure the total mass. And the difference is the mass of what's in the container, correct? Right. So that's the mass, and then the volume you read off of the. So that's how you do your liquid. How about your solids? Right. Solids easy. You just drop it on the balance. But how do you get the volume of a solid? It depends, right? If it's a regular solid, you can measure uh, one or more dimensions and use a, a formula, right? If you have a cylinder, right, you just measure the length of the cylinder and you measure the diameter and use the formula. Right? You determine the area of a slice and then how high is it times that, there's your volume. But uh, an easier way, especially for irregular solids, right, is to submerge them in a liquid. If they're completely submerged in the liquid, then they will displace a certain amount of liquid. So if you if you know the volume of the liquid before and you know the volume of the liquid after, 
The difference is the volume of what you dropped in it. But that only works when? When the solid is denser than the liquid. It has to be completely submerged. If it's not completely submerged, say, um, I'll just use ice. If you wanted the density of ice, you have water, liquid water, and you have like measurements here on the side. And then you put your ice cube in there, and it's going to be what 90% below and 10% above. Right? So you're only measuring the volume of this much right here. All right? So you have to, the, the object has to be completely submerged. Uh, fortunately, both of the objects that we're going to determine the volume of are submersible. I mean, they're they're more dense than water. The rubber stopper, and they're up here, rubber stoppers, and that metal. The metal, it's irregular shape. So you can use one or two or three or four pieces of it, however many you want, that'll give you a good difference in volume reading. But you need to know the mass of it first. Right? So you, you take those pieces, get their masses on the balance. Then you submerge them in the liquid and measure the difference, the change in volume. And then you can calculate your density. For that metal, I want you to use the density that you determined and come up here and look at this document right here. It has densities of, of elements. I'll tell you, it is an element. So you look at the densities. And you find your density on there and say, okay, I think it's this metal because it's this density. Okay? That's your unknown. Everybody's doing the same unknown. So when you get to it, you don't have to put a number there. Okay? Um, all right. So um, also, this is one thing we learned about reading volume in, in our um, lab techniques lab. You want to have your eye level with the device. Right? If you're looking high like this or low like that, you introduce what kind of error? Starts with a P. Parallax error. If you if you introduce parallax error into your reading, it's going to be off by a considerable amount. So your eye needs to be level, and you need to read the liquid since we're only going to use. Well, we use water and isopropyl alcohol. Uh, they're going to be a, a concave meniscus. So you read the bottom of the meniscus. All right. Um, it's kind of backwards. The post-lab questions come first. <laughs> then the then recording the values. And uh, let's see. Doing your calculations. And then we have pre-lab questions are at the back. I think it's arranged that way because whoever designed this lab, uh, one of the pre-lab questions for you to do the pre-lab questions and then rip that page off and hand it in. But I don't do it that way. I just do it all together and I'm in together. But we are going to look at the pre-lab questions. Right. What safety precautions should you take when working with rubbing alcohol? Protect your eyes. Yep. It's not so important to protect your clothes, right? Because rubbing alcohol is not not that dangerous. But you don't want to breathe a lot of fumes, right? What else? It's an alcohol, correct? Can it burn? Yeah, yeah. Keep it away from open flame. Okay, how about the next one? Define the following terms as they apply to this experiment. Density. You can do it in words or you can do it in formula, as long as you tell me what each symbol means. All right. Density is mass divided by volume. All right. Where it's the mass that's associated with a given increment in volume. What's an extensive property? We mentioned intensive property. What's an extensive property? Right. It's the property that changes its value with the amount of substance. So 
mass and volume are both extensive properties. The more substance you have, the more mass you have, the more volume you have. But when you ratio them, now you've got an intensive property in density. That's the point. All right. A student uh, determined the density of an unidentified liquid known to be one of the following four compounds. I found 7.3 milliliters had a mass of 6.52 grams. 7.3 milliliters and 6.52 grams. All right. What's that? Anybody calculate that yet? I'm sorry? 0 0.89. Right. Two significant figures. And this is grams per milliliter. Remember, when you do a calculation, you do the same thing to the units as you do to the numbers. If you divide this number into that number, you divide this unit into that unit. So this unit is divided into that unit. That's how you determine the units from any calculation. You just do the same thing to them that you did to the numbers. Uh, and then compare it to the liquid, right? 0 0.89 compared to what? Wait a minute. Oh, we have to go back, don't we? Isn't there a chart back here? Did I pass it? Okay. Oh, there they are. What's the closest one? Ethyl chloride is the closest one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what's, what is the mass of 9.5 milliliters of ethyl iodide? So if we have this formula and we're looking for mass, we just solve that equation for mass, right? Density times volume. Just take that over there as a multiplier. So what's the density of ethyl iodide? Let me go back up here and look. Ethyl iodide. 1.9 grams per milliliter. So the density is 1.9. Was that it? Just 1.9? Four. Grams per milliliter. Multiplied by volume. And the volume is what? 9.5. Okay. And that's equal to the mass, which is what? It's about less than 20. Isn't it? Yeah. 18.4, that's close enough, grams. Okay, uh, what's the volume of an acetone sample whose mass is 6.95 grams? So in this case, we solve for volume. So I bring volume over here and the density over here, right? Then we have a mass of 6.95 grams. And the density of acetone is what? 0 0.79 grams per milliliter. So if we if we do our dimensional analysis, we say, okay, this grams is in the denominator, that's in the numerator, they cancel. But this milliliters is in the denominator of the denominator, which mathematically is the numerator. So it flips and that gives us what? What what do you get? Eight point seven? Okay. Well let's see. Which one which one are we? We're restricted by this one, this is the measured value. This is determined from, this is our conversion factor. So we're restricted only by that one. We would round off to that many, be 8.80 milliliters, right? 
And four, a collection of glass beads has a mass of 29.33 grams. The beads were transferred to a graduated cylinder containing 13.5 milliliters of water. The volume of the water plus the beads was 25.2. What's the density? All right. So this is where we're determining the volume by difference. So if we're going to calculate the density, we know what the mass is, right? Uh, 29.33 grams. What we need to know is the volume. So if we have a graduated cylinder, and the water in it begins at 13.5 milliliters. Say 13.5 milliliters. Then we add the beads in the bottom, and it goes up to 25.2, okay? Why did it do that? Because of the bead, yeah, displacement. Mm -hmm. So what's the volume of the beads? Minus 13.5, right? What was that? Okay, 11.7 milliliters. 11.7 milliliters. And then what do we get from that? <laughs> That's good. Saves me some work. 2.51. Divide that by the volume. And the volume is the difference between these two. Oh, that's it, isn't it? That's all the pre-lab questions. Okay. You guys ought to get 100% on that right there. If you don't, then not paying attention. Okay. Any questions? Which one? D. Uh, Oh, what's the volume of an acetone sample whose mass is 6.95 grams? Okay, we take this formula. Remember, any mathematical formula, if you know all of the values of the variables except for one, you can solve for the unknown. The unknown in this case is going to be volume. We want to know the volume. So if we bring the volume over here, and the density goes over there, that's our new formula. Okay, so what's the mass? 6.95 grams. And what's the density of acetone? 0 0.7 uh, grams per milliliter. There we go. So the grams cancel, leaves us with milliliters. And that was the eight point something one. Milliliters. There you go.